As I look out on all of you, I want you to know I have a uh, a joyful burden for you. I'm surprised every week that God has called me to stand here and do this. I often pray that uh, if there's a better man for the job, because there is, (laughs) that he would make himself known and that God would place him here to guide you through the future and coming days which are going to be rocky and got to be like whitewater rapids as human history always has been and always will be. But I'm surrounded by good leaders and I'm and I love you. I would hand over the reins if God ordained it simply because I love you. Not because I would want to not do it, not not lead, not be here. But the, the message that God continues to put on my heart is what we talked about in Sunday school this morning for the whole time. We read some scripture and then we talked for the whole time about the nature of the church, the local church. Playing church has no place in the kingdom. And playing church doesn't do anything for you as individual believers. It does nothing. Being the church is God's plan for everything for you. As I read through 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and as I look, the church is intended to be the main force in your life for all matters that trouble you. Conflict between you as brothers and sisters in Christ is supposed to go through the church. If you can't deal with it yourself, if, if, you, if you look at Matthew 18, 15 and go, I, I just can't then the church is supposed to be here for you. Paul said, would we rather air our grievances and dirty laundry before these unbelieving courts? Is there no one in the church that can decide between right and wrong for you? We will judge angels, he goes on to say in that chapter of 2 Corinthians 6. The church, the local church, is supposed to be the hub of your life in Christ while you're on the planet. He's the mainstay, amen? I mean, His Word is the rock. He's the rock. He he is your foundation, but He has provided the church to equip you and to train you and to be there for you. I encourage you to be broken here. I encourage you to hurt in front of us here so that we know how to pray, so that we know what to do. So that you're not alone. Have you not seen over the last few months the government's not going to be here for you? Are you looking to them for sanity? I hope not. My burden is for the local church, for this community of believers, is precious to me. We're supposed to live real life here. So read with me 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We're not going to go through 9. We're just going to read 1 through 3. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth. Now, the church in Corinth, I don't know how you imagine that in your mind, but it was probably between 40 and 60 people. I mean, I think thousands of people. I, I, when I read about churches in the Bible, I think that must have been massive. No, it, it's a little congregation of believers in this sinful city of Corinth who have come together 
And boy, they make a mess of it. Have you, who's read 1 Corinthians? Woo, mama. They make a mess of it. But that's the church of God there that's in Corinth. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus, those called to be saints, together with all those who in every place, other churches too, call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Both their Lord and ours. In the New Testament, there are over 700 references to Jesus as Lord. And a couple dozen references to Him as Savior. Jesus is the Lord of the church. He's the king here. And society has lost its stinking mind, and they are going to go off after every idol. But in the church, in the local church, when you come here, Jesus is Lord here. That should be a place, of, a place you run to in times of trouble, a, an anchor in your storm, a, a comfort when everything around you is going nuts, you should be able to look at your local church and say, ah, Jesus is Lord. Do you know uh, the first century Christians would walk, that's how they would greet each other? Jesus is Lord. It got them in tons of trouble. Tons of trouble. Because in first century Rome, you were supposed to say Caesar is Lord, and you had to go once a year to worship Him and light incense to Him. And that's what got Christians in all types of trouble. That's why they're putting on animal suits and getting eaten by lions and stuff in the Colosseum. It's because they would not say Caesar is Lord. Lord, it cost them something to be Christians. Possibly their lives. Certainly their family relationships were in jeopardy. But the name of Jesus was precious to them. More precious than gold. More precious than their old lives. lives. More precious than any other relationship was their relationship with Christ. And I'm not trying to paint them as perfect. You read 1 Corinthians, you know they're not perfect. These, these letters were written because they weren't perfect. But God makes it clear in these letters what He expects of His people, that He, He is Lord. And we are to love each other. This is how men will know you're my disciples, Jesus said. Is that you love each other. There's a lot of love here, but we also need to work on it. There is a lot of love here, no doubt. But we need to take intentional steps to love each other more. To show we love each other more. When the rubber meets the road, you're going to find Christians loving one another. That, that, that's what we do. And love carries with it a huge burden. Doesn't love carry with it a huge burden in that relationship when you love someone else? It carries a burden of forgiveness? <laughs> wow, that's the hard one. The love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 tells us all about it. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love suffers no wrong. Love forgives. Love doesn't seek out its own way. Don't you hate that chapter sometimes? <laughs> you're hearing it at every wedding you've ever been to and you're sitting out there in the congregation going, good luck. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> it's so true. It's funny because it's true. But that love chapter describes Jesus' love for us. That, that's it. That's His love for us. And we're to model that love to each other. And it is impossible. But it's not something we don't strive for because it's impossible. It's something we should strive for in every word, every thought, every action. It's tough. But as this world gets crazier and crazier and Scripture promises us it will, now, men will proceed from bad to worse. Period. They're lovers of self, lovers of money, haters of their parents, disobedient. To, they, they love their belly. They, 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 they worship the God of their belly, the God of their appetites. They're going to go after their appetites. And as the world loses its collective mind, I want us at First Baptist Church moments to know that we can come here and we love each other. That's my prayer. Is that this is your port in the storm. That this, 
I know Jesus is, but this church is where you come. And where you invite people to come if they need loving, you know? But we're also the pillar and support of the truth. I, I, turn over with me quickly to 1 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 16. It's, we do love, but we stand on the truth. You don't lie to people you love, you know? Well, when you do, you're not acting loving towards them. God doesn't lie to us. He doesn't sugarcoat things. He tells us the way that it is. 1 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 16. Paul writes this beautiful pastoral epistle, 1 Timothy, to Timothy, who's going to be the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And he says in verse 14, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress or support of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. I love what Scripture does here. It mentions what godliness is, and then it points to Him. Godliness, Jesus Christ, godliness in the flesh. He was manifested in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit. We read about that in his baptism when the Spirit alights on him. He's vindicated by the Spirit. He's seen by angels. He's proclaimed among the nations. He's believed on in the world. And he was taken up in glory. And he left us, the church, to be the pillar and support of the truth. We're to be a people that lives with intention and love and purpose and a desire to be more like Christ. We need to strive for holiness and support the truth at every turn. The truth. The truth. Pontius Pilate asked Jesus the age-old question, what is truth? You can hear him laughing when he says it. Jesus told his disciples what truth was. Father, sanctify them in truth, John 17, 17. Your word is truth. So we are a people of God, proclaiming the Word of God to a twisted and perverse generation that wants nothing to do with it. And some will hear, and the Word will not return void, and Christ will save them if we don't swerve from the truth. Let's pray for a moment. Father God, we love you. Forgive us when we don't, you know. Forgive us, Lord God, when we don't act like we love you and, and really in our hearts when we don't love you. We never love you in the proportions you deserve, but, but we do love you. Help us to be the pillar in support of the truth. Help us to be the light and the salt in our community and around the world. Help us to be Christ to one another. Help us to love one another. Protect this fellowship, Father, please, from every trick of the enemy, every weapon of offense. Protect us from false believers. Protect us from the tares among the wheat. Protect us from false teaching. And all the wiles of the enemy. We know his schemes. His schemes are false teaching. His schemes are idolatry. Protect us, Father. Be with our brother Russell and our sister Gina as they go in for procedures this week. We pray that you will give the doctors success and wisdom. You are the great physician. You knit us together in our mother's womb. Only you can hold the parts together and make them work. It is magnificent, the human body, what you've created. And you give men and women the ability to put it back together by your grace and through your wisdom. So I pray that my brother and sister will see radical success in the procedures they're going through, Lord God, and quick recovery 
and they can be back among us rejoicing and praising you for all that you've done physically in their life. Bless us as we break your word here, Heavenly Father, that we would let the cares of this world fade away and that we would rest in you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians 10 is where you want to go next. 1 Corinthians 10.1 I'm going to continue where I left off last week instead of going into Philippians, which I had intended to do um, originally when I walked out of the pulpit last week. But I thought in, in light of the events of this week, it was important that we finish that message from last week. When we talk about the communion of the saints, what holds us together. I want you to, I'm asking you, to give a measured response to those who disagree with you politically. Not no response, just a measured one. The world is watching. The world is watching. And if we take the name Christian on our lips, on Facebook, on Twitter. Members of the body of the Christ attacking with vitriol other members of the body of Christ on a public platform disgraces Jesus Christ. Stop attacking and devouring one another. What is wrong? Do we not trust this word? Love one another. Wouldn't you rather be wronged than bite your brother or sister's head off in front of everyone? It's a rhetorical question. I hope your answer is, yeah, I would rather be wronged. Yeah, I, I would rather not say what I'm thinking if it's going to reflect poorly on Christ. But we're going to read it here in just a minute. Jesus says, if you're my disciples, they'll know you by your love for one another. And we talked about it already. 1 Corinthians 13. Boy, that love is tough. It's tough to show it. But we are the saints of God. The holy ones of God. Holy, set apart for His service. Set apart to be a bastion of light in a dark world. Set apart to show them how to do this thing. That's what we're supposed to do. Let's show them how to do this. Let's show them who to follow. Let's show them who to love. Let's show them how to interact with one another. Let's show them what it means to be wronged, even if you just perceive that you're wronged, and not lash out and give full vent to your anger. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Be angry and do not sin. Being angry is not sinful. Amen? Isn't that what Scripture says? You better be angry. You better be righteous indignation at what you see going on in the planet as people just spurn the Word of God and do whatever they want to do and scoff at the church and scoff at God. We ought to be angry, but don't give full vent. Be angry and do not sin. It's tough. Amen? Isn't it tough? It's tough. It's tough to be a human being. <laughs> But we're warned away from these unholy behaviors. And last week we began studying holiness and our relationship to God. Uh, let's, let's wrap that up. As God's people, we should be holy. We're warned against unholy practices. Read with me 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 10. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Oh, amen. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples to us that we might not desire evil as they did. In other words, in other words learn from their mistakes. Verse 7, do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And last week we chased that passage of Scripture down. 
We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. The same destroyer, by the way, you can look up here now if you would. The same destroyer, by the way, that passed over Egypt and took the firstborn. There's only one destroyer. He's coming. Right? He's coming for all of us. Or is he? Oh, wait, no, he's not. He's not coming for those that are covered in the blood of the Lamb. Wait a second. Our end is not, if we're in Christ, our end is not doom. This political garbage that we see circling around the toilet bowl is when it's getting flushed now. These governments aren't going to last. We have a King of Kings and a Lord of Lords who's coming back and He will rule them with an iron scepter. Nations don't know what to do. They think they do, but they dishonor Christ. Read Psalm 2. But we should not be idolaters in the body of Christ. We should lift nothing up above Christ. We should not be sexually immoral in the body of Christ. We should not test Christ. As we talked about that saying, if you loved me, this wouldn't happen. If you love me, that's testing Christ. Putting his love to the test based on your circumstances. Finally, we shouldn't grumble against God saying, you don't know what you're doing. I know better. Now I want you to understand something about these things. Every one of us will do these things. <laughs> right? I mean, we're all going to do these here or there. What God's saying is this should not be the hallmark of your life if you are a Christ follower. When you do these things, you should be convicted in the Holy Spirit. You should repent and ask forgiveness for these things. You won't be perfect. Can a Christian sin? A true, honest-to-goodness Christian. Can we sin? Yes, you bet. You bet. Can a good Christian fall into grievous sin, a season of their life when they're in sin? Yes. Yes, we can. Can a true Christian walk in sin for one year, two years, five years, ten years, and not repent, and not feel convicted, and not ask forgiveness, and not be grieved by their sin? No. No. No, you can't. If you're living in your sin and you're happy as a lark, high on the hog, you're not a believer, no matter what you call yourself. It's convicting, isn't it? You know who that statement hits the hardest? People it shouldn't hit the hardest. <laughs> true believers. True believers are going, oh my gosh, am I really? Am I saying I've got to question my faith? And the devil's going to work his way in there. You know who's not going to respond to that? People that are living high in the hog and living like, in their sin like slop and loving it. They're like, ah, nah. It's that guy now. Yeah. They're going to go through history and pull up Hitler and say, I'm better than that guy. That's what always happens. You pick the worst characters in human history and point to them and say, I'm better than them, so I'm okay. It's not true. But these ha things happen to them. Let's, let's look at verses 6 and, verses, and verse 11. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. The Old Testament means something. The reason that these things are recorded is so that we can look back at those and not desire what they desired. Not do what they did. Who's ever read the Old Testament before and just been mad at Israel? Has anyone just read that? Like, Come on! Come on, pillar of fire? Cloud by day? Pillar of fire by night? Red Sea? I'm looking at it. Weren't you there for that? What's wrong with you people? So we should look back at that and say, mm, I'm not going to repeat that mistake. And that's really what the Old Testament's for. I'm not going to repeat that mistake. I'm going to look at the things in my life where God has delivered me, and I'm not going to grumble. I'm going to reflect on those red, my Red Sea, and I'm going to reflect on having been brought through the, the, the God's wrath and, and be fine through my faith in Christ. I'm going to thank Him rather than grumble against Him, and that's what those things are written for. Verse 11. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Andy Stanley can say we can unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament as much as he wants. God's Word says Andy Stanley's wrong. We cannot unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. God gave it to us as an example. 
of what to do and what not to do. And Christ is the hero of the Old Testament. So let's take a look here at verse 10. In light of that, I, I'm sorry, verse 12. I'm chapter 10, verse 12, I'm sorry. Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Do you see what an introspective exercise Christianity is? Not just saved. Z formation, all that in a bag of chips, and we're just saved. Did anyone ever watch In Living Color and take that reference? Okay. All right. No, no one took that reference. Z formation. <laughs> Embarrassed that I watched In Living Color, but I did. That's... <laughs> our job is to look at our lives and see how we're walking and reflect on our faith confess our sins, and walk in holiness. That's what we're supposed to do every minute of every day. Just reflect on our lives. Where am I? Am I pleasing to the Lord right now? Am I not pleasing to the Lord right now? And enjoy, walk, and say, I want to be pleasing to you. Give me the strength to be pleasing. Repent of our sins. Repent. Every time you sin, repent. Confess it as sin. Repent of it. Leave it there and move forward in Christ. That's what we are supposed to do day in and day out. We're to look at these things. Take heed of your life, lest you fall. Now, does that mean you can lose your salvation? <sighs> No. Fall. Uh, let's take a look. Hebrews 7, 22 and 24 through 5. It's up there on the screen for you. Sorry. I heard people running for the verse. It's, you can go there, but it's, it's up on the screen. I love that sound of the saints turning the pages. This makes Jesus the guarantor, the guarantor of a better covenant. He holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. <laughs> Amen. Consequently, listen, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Why? Since he always lives to make intercession for them. <laughs> for God not to hold you in perpetual grace, one of two things has to happen. Jesus would have had to be found unworthy or God would have to ignore His request. Neither one of those things has ever happened. All right, The whole basis of our faith is that Christ is worthy. Jesus Christ stands at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for each one of us who are true believers every moment of every day. He lives to make intercession for you. Man. Is there more? Sure there is. We just read it. 1 Corinthians 1, 7-9. You wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? God is faithful. <laughs> God secures our salvation. We don't. God's faithful. That's why I'm saved. God's faithful. That's why I'm forever saved. God's faithful. Amen? Isn't that right? He speaks truth all the time. He keeps every one of His promises. Every time. Jude 24-25. through 25. There's only one chapter in Jude, by the way. That's why it's 24-25. through 25. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you, what? Blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy be glory. To Him who is able to present you blameless And finally, meaning finally the last one I'm going to read, not finally the only one there is in Scripture, Ephesians 1, 11, and then 13 through 14. In Him, in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance. <laughs> Having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. It was God's plan to save you. He works all things according to the counsel of His will. He predestined it. Remember the picture I showed the other week with Satan and Jesus arm wrestling? They aren't arm wrestling. God has a plan. He is pulling it off perfectly. Perfectly. He's never gone, oh, never expected that. Not, not once. Not once. But I'm echoing. Russell, could you turn me down just a tad? I'm, I'm hearing an echo. Not once has God failed. He saw it all from the beginning. Before there was time, he knew what was going to happen. 
He had a plan. He created everything with His plan in place. Amen? Everything. Because if He didn't, He's not sovereign. And if He's not sovereign, the Bible's lying. He's either sovereign or He's not. What do we believe? In Him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is what? The guarantee of our inheritance. The guarantee. Until we acquire possession of it. We will acquire possession of it. Why? To the praise of His glory. Folks, our salvation is on God, not us. He saved us. He protects us. He holds us in His hand and no one can snatch Him out of His hand, not even us. I sense that you remain unconvinced. Maybe that's not true. Maybe that's not true. If you believe you can lose your salvation, you either believe that God is impotent or He's a liar. I don't know if I'd put it any more bluntly than that. Either He's lying or He can't do what He says He's doing. Those are your two options. So take heed lest you fall means pay attention to your life so that you don't walk blatantly into sin and impede your communication with God. Impede your relationship with God. Make things rockier than they need to be. Make Him discipline you. When we walk willingly into sin, we make Him discipline us. Who's ever said to your kids, if you do that, bad things are going to happen. Don't make me come in there. Who's ever said that? Don't make me come in there. If I come in there, you're not going to like what happens next. You know, the, you know the spiel. We all have the card that we got when they were born that the doctor gave us. The things that we're to say. <laughs> Don't make me come in there. I warned you. You brought this on yourself every week. I had the same talk every week. You brought this on yourself. It's still unfair to them. They don't understand. It still seems unfair to them. But you, you're right when you say, I told you, didn't I? Who's ever just tried to get really logical with your kids? Didn't I tell you? No, 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 I just want to make sure that I'm not mistaken. We did talk about this, right? Yeah. So, so now that the consequences are coming, why are you mad at me? You should be mad at you. You did this to yourself. Am I the only one? I'm, I don't think I'm the only one. I hear that, that you did this. That they still don't get it. Zoop. Not fair. It's perfectly fair. There's never been something more fair. I don't know. But God goes through that with us, right? God, why me? Well, I, let me get the list out of the 12 things I told you blatantly in my word not to do that you're doing. And let's see maybe if now you can understand why you're having some hardship. I'm disciplining you. You can't do that. You're on punishment. You're, you know, whatever the case may be. So it interacts with our relationship with Him and makes Him discipline us, and it's a bad witness to the world. Without just blatantly living in sin, it's a poor witness. We're, we're wrecking our witness. Does God still love us? Yeah. You tell your kids when they go out, hey, honor the Lord and don't embarrass the family, right? Come back in one piece. And if they come back and they've embarrassed the family, you're going to be angry with them, but you don't kick them. I mean, right? I hope not. There are some major issues our children are going through. Major, major issues that I, frankly, I don't remember going through that when I was in high school. I, I don't. I do remember sinning in high school, though. Who remembers sinning in high school? Anyone remember? Different issues, still sinning. They are struggling with things. They're being taught things that are unbiblical, and they're being taught as if they're real, and, it, it, and, and they're clinging to those things, and they're wrestling those things through it, and they're going to make mistakes. Our job as a Christian is to love them, regardless of the stupid decisions they make. Amen? Isn't that right? We love them anyway. And we should tell them that we love them as we're disciplining them. I love you. I love you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't be disciplining you right now. You know, God's the same way. And parenting is a great snapshot into the heart of God, isn't it? 
Any parents out there? You're like, oh. You read that verse before you had kids, you're like, bloop, stoop. And then you read it when you have kids, you're like, oh. Yeah. Right? God's good. So take heed lest you fall. Into sin. Not out of grace. If you could fall out of it, it wouldn't be grace. I could go on and on and on. It's, it's grace. It's a gift. It's His gift that He gives you. <laughs> yeah. All right. I wasn't waving you off. I'm just I'm, I'm trying to mentally make myself leave this topic and go to the next one. So if you think you're upright in the Lord, pay attention to your walk. Get the planks out of your own eye before you start making the, taking the specks out of everybody else's eye. Make sure you're locked in before you start. It's so easy to point all the fingers before when I've got huge problems in my own walk. Right? Let's pay attention to us. That's enough worry, isn't it? So we can escape sin if we walk intentionally and walk in God's Spirit. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13 through 22. We're going to go ahead and read here. Everything you're hearing right now, I planned on saying last week. Isn't that crazy? Talk about wildly underestimating the time. All right. Verse 13. Oh, man. I'm going to hate this verse, too. No temptation is overtaking you that's not common. Command. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. <laughs> How convicting. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I couldn't help it. Yes, I could. If you're going through the temptation, God provides a way of escape for you. So that you don't have to do that thing that you're getting ready to do. There is a way of escape. I can look back at every sin I've ever committed that I can remember. And know I had a choice at some point where I didn't have to get in the back seat of the car with that pretty girl. I had a moment when I knew that I didn't have to pop, take that first swallow of alcohol. There was an opportunity for me to make the right choice. And I didn't. God gave me a way out of it. And you read through James and you read about how sin happens and, and, and sin starts with a thought, right? And you nurture that thought in your mind and that thought gives birth to sin. You, you entertain that thought. You're on Facebook and you're reading through and people you thought you respected have opinions different than yours. And you're like, you know what? I've got to read that again. I'm going to read it one more time. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. And you're walking around. Man, I can't believe they think like this. What am I? How should I respond to that? You don't have to respond to it. You don't have to. You didn't have to read it twice. You didn't have to finish it. Can't you tell from the first two sentences how it's going to be? You can, right? Well, you know what? Zoop, I'm going to scroll up until I find some weird advertisement for something I don't need. I'm not going to read that about my brother or sister so that I can nurture hate in my heart and lash out on Facebook and ruin my witness to everyone that knows that both of us are Christians and put a root of bitterness in my brother or sister. It's insane to me, not because I'm not tempted to do it or don't ever do it myself, but how easy we're pushed into it. How easy I fall into that. How easy I step into that when I could have just ignored the whole thing. Think about what you're doing. Amen? Isn't that what this verse says? Think. You know what tempts you. Amen? <laughs> no one's going to say amen to that. You know what tempts you. You know when you're getting close. If I'm the only one that has these feelings, you can take a vote right now and vote me out as your pastor. But you know when you're getting close to sin, a sin that you like, and it starts to feel a little bit warm to you. So you sidle in just a little bit closer. And you start tempting and testing God there, don't you? you know, sidle in just a little bit closer. And sidle in just a little bit closer. Until before you know it, you are in over your head and you are sinning away the day. We've all done that. Because our sin is pleasurable for a season. Isn't that what Scripture says? If we didn't like it, it wouldn't be a temptation. We like it. I like being right. And I like proving to you that I'm right. 
So, <laughs> now I got my platform here. I, I don't know, it's just... And I might be right. Probably am. Uh, I'm just joking. <laughs> but you know how it is. And, and, and this is real stuff. This isn't some, platit some religious platitude. We know when we're walking into sin, we can feel it pulling at us, and we have a decision right there to make. Am I going to engage this, or, or am I going to do what Scripture's getting ready to tell us we should do? Let, 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 why don't we get Tim shut up and let God talk for a minute? Okay, here we go. Um, Verse 13, no temptation is overtaking you that's not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, what? Flee. Flee from idolatry. Don't stand there and fight your sin. You can't win. Amen? Who can just testify? You can't win. you got to flee. you got to flee. One click away. One click away. I'm one click away from going to that website I know that I shouldn't go to. Flee. Put the phone down. Walk away. Flee. Run. What does God say in Ephesians uh, 6, 10-18 about the armor of God? Put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand in the evil day. Not fight your sin in the evil day. Endure. He's given you the strength to endure. He tells us to flee from idolatry. Take that. I'm, I'm trying to give you some practical advice here just from Scripture because I'm not smart enough to have practical advice of my own. You get a thought that's hitting your mind and you know it's going to lead to sin. You take that thought captive. Isn't that what Scripture says? To the obedience of Christ. You pronounce it. Even if you have to say it out loud, that's a sinful thought. I'm not going to indulge it. Start doing that. Put it to the side. Then do what Philippians tells you to do and start thinking about things that are holy and pure and righteous and just, and put that thought off to the side. Grab onto Scripture. Start saying a Scripture. Do anything you can not to walk into sin. God's given you tons of tools. The weapons of righteousness for your right hand and your left to take every thought captive and to tear down strongholds. It's all right here. But if you spend... 20 hours a day watching television, you're not going to have much of this in there to fight with. We need to get in the Word and we need to fight. So, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. <laughs> I know this is Scripture, so it must be true, but I speak to a sensible people. <laughs> must not meet me. He's talking to somebody else there. I speak... Oh, oh, here we go. Clarity. I speak as to a sensible people. In other words... If you were sensible, this would make sense, but you're not, okay? If, if, if we thought about this appropriately, I speak as if the sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Now here we go. Here's where we're pulling Christ into it. Ready? The cup of blessing that we bless. The cup of our fellowship. The thing that we take and pass around. The thing that we love. Is it not participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break. Is it not participation in the body of Christ? So when we're taking communion, and this would have fit more last week, but when we're taking communion together, when we're coming into the communion of the saints, am I bringing in all of my sinful thoughts and actions and deeds, or am I coming in here confessed? Am I coming in here repentant? Am I coming in here humble? Verse 17, because there is one bread. We who are many are one body. Man, we need that right now. We who are many are one body. For we all partake of one bread. Who did you profess as Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. One bread, one body, one faith, one baptism, one church, one body, the bride of Christ. Anything that's not like Him needs to be cast out of our lives. Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices, participants in the altar. The priests would eat the food that had been sacrificed, some of it. What do I apply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Bear with me here for a second, okay? Just, fo just follow along. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. In other words, the sins that we commit, are they anything? Not really. But here's why it has effect. No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. When we engage with things of the flesh, we are engaging with spiritual things who are not of the Lord. That's what sin is. That's what sin is. 
You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? That goes back to verse 12. Look at how you're walking. Am I going to make God discipline me? Why would I do that? Let's look at how we walk. Let's be in the Word. Let's not make God have to discipline us. That's all that this is saying. Let's not make God have to discipline us. We can't practice syncretism in the church. We can't worship two gods. You can't worship God and mammon both. You can't worship God and politics both. You have to pick one. You can't worship God and your personal prosperity both. You have to pick one. Which one are you going to choose? You can't worship God and your happiness both. Which one are you going to choose? Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. Is that your choice today? And it might be your choice right now because it sounds really cool now, but when you get out there and you're in traffic and that guy's in front of you, you know the guy. You've all been behind that guy. You know, that's, that's when it gets difficult. Will I serve the Lord now or will I curse this fool out? You know, that, that, that's a decision that I have to make. Let's turn over to James 4. We're going to come back to, we're going to wrap up in Corinthians here in a second, but let's look at James 4. James 4 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? <laughs> the things that are creeping into the church because we just want to be friends with the world. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it's of no purpose that the Scripture says He yearns jealously over the Spirit that He made to dwell in us? Have you ever thought about that before? God's jealous for your affection. He's jealous for your worship. He wants you to worship Him and He wants to pour His love out on you. Just you and Him. He just wants it to be you and Him. He wants 100% of what you got. If you would just put 100% of what you got on the altar, He would be so happy. He would be so happy. And when you stray and when you commit adultery to God and you go out and worship other things, He gets jealous for you because He loves you. That's why He compares it to adultery. You love your wife and she cheats on you. You get jealous and angry. Vice versa. Same with men. You love your husband and he cheats on you. You get jealous and angry. You thought you had the allegiance of your friend and they take off and they curse you like they never knew you. You get jealous and angry. They've betrayed that relationship. When we pursue the flesh, we betray our relationship with Christ. He has filled you with the Holy Spirit. Do you know all that the Holy Spirit does? He worships. He pours out worship to the Father. He glorifies the Son. He makes you more like the Son. Yet we, cons we insist on grieving the Holy Spirit of God by indulging in the flesh and chasing things that make our flesh happy. But He gives more grace. Verse 6, praise God. He gives more grace. He gives more grace than you can sin. Do you believe that today? His grace exceeds your sin infinitely. Infinitely. Jesus did that on the cross. Submit yourselves, verse 7, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Just resist. Fight. Just resist. Flee. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Isn't that right? We spend all of our time running away from our sin when we ought to be just drawing near to God. Take your eyes off your sin for a second. Quit beating yourself up and look to the Lord. Say, I want to be pleasing to you. I want you. I want more of you. I want to love you more. I want, I want to be more hungry for you. I, I just want you. And the devil's going to be pointing to all your sins. And you're going to be saying, I've been forgiven. I've been forgiven. I, I repent, God. I just want more of, of you and make it a joyful exercise to pursue Christ, not run from your sins. Do you see the difference? I'm running from the enemy. That's one thing because I'm running in fear. And what does Scripture say? They'll flee when no one pursues. Isn't that what Scripture says about the unbelievers? They'll flee when no one pursues. But I'll pursue Christ. Pursue Him. Pursue Him in prayer. Pursue Him in the Word. You're all wrapped up about your sin. Confess it as sin. Move forward and start pursuing Christ. Dwell on the good things of the Lord. Dwell on the charity of the Lord. Dwell on the grace of the Lord. Dwell on the love of the Lord. Pursue Christ. When you're down, pursue Christ. And I, So help me, it's the last thing I want to do when I'm down and depressed. Is get in the Word and worship. 
Force yourself. He has given you a spirit of self-control. Say, I know there are promises in here. I know there is love in here. I know there is power in here. I'm going to get on my knees. I'm going to open this word and I'm going to read. I'm going to read until I'm not depressed. I'm going to read. I'm going to read and pray. And I'm going to continue. And if that's not working, I'm going to call my brother or sister in Christ, in the church, so that they can pray with me and edify me and speak the truth of God to me. Do you see why each one of us is so important? Isn't alone terrible? Was the songwriter right? Did he say one's the loneliest number? Yeah, one's the loneliest number, right? Or is it two? Two can be as lonely as one. Uh, Never mind. That's not in Scripture. Two can be as bad as one if you're with the wrong person. Yeah, that's right. But one is the loneliest number. Be with God. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Be with the Lord. Be with your brothers and sisters in Christ and you and walk uprightly. Okay, all right. Holiness and love for God is only half our battle. Let's look at verse 11 of of James 4. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges, judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law of God. What does that mean? The law commands believers to love one another. It's going to be up there on the screen for you. John 13, 34 through 35. Jesus said this. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Man, just as I have loved you. This is a tall order. Now listen, just as I have loved you, you're also to love one another. Would Jesus have forgiven Judas if Judas would have not hanged himself and come and repented? You know he would have. You know he would have because of his character. He forgave Peter who denied him three times. You know what Jesus would have thought? And I'm not trying to be weird. It was by design that I hung on that cross. It was my plan to hang on that cross. And what you intended for evil, Judas, I intended for good. You're forgiven, brother. That's what he would have said. You're forgiven. Thanks for the worship, you know. You're forgiven, just like you forgave Peter. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. By all this, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Powerful. Next, Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Nothing. But in humility, (laughs) count others more significant than yourselves. Wow. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. He's talking about people in the body of Christ now. He tells you not to be a stumbling block in front of your brother. He tells you not to be, he tells you to be humble. He tells you to look for others' needs. He tells you to pray for other people. That's right. Look at the congregation to which we belong. Count others as more important than yourselves. Walk humbly with your God, and God will exalt you. You don't have to exalt yourself. He'll exalt you. He'll exalt you. It's Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. And God told Moses to tell Aaron to say this over the people. Speak my name over the people. I'm just gonna, for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to read it until I have it memorized. And I, this year, I'd like to bless us with it as we go out. We have a serious mission that we're on to lead people to Jesus and to show the love of Christ. But everything in our flesh is going to scream against us not to. I want to pray this over you. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Father God, bless Your people. Lord, bless Your people this week. Help us to be Your people. For those who are fooled and think they're Your people and they're not, we pray that You will convict them. Lord, move in mighty ways on them so that You won't say, I never knew You. For those of us who are true followers, Lord God, I pray that you will encourage and strengthen us. Give us courage, give us wisdom, and give us love. That we can be your voice. Again, be with Russell and be with Gina as they go in for procedures this week, Father God. And bring healing to them. They are precious to us. We love you, Father. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.